When my children were born, I spent some time doing what most new parents do, dreaming about what they would be or do when they got older. We often wonder about our kids. We think, you know, are they going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a landscaper, or a pastor? You know, some of us want our kids to follow in our footsteps, of course. I, I have a son-in-law who decided he's going to follow my footsteps. Money. They say your daughter marries somebody like your like their father, right? So she married a guy who's now a landscaper. And I figure that means in about 10 to 12, he'll be a pastor. <laughs> but, uh, it's interesting because being a parent is such a huge thing. There's pressure, there's responsibility, and a good parent knows that no matter what, they've always got to be there for their kids. They've always got to be there. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes with children, things don't act, always work out as we plan, do they? Sometimes mm -hmm. things go a little bit astray. I'm utterly convinced that, uh, that our doctor uh, wasn't doing his job on the day my children were born because he handed us this child, and I got to hold both our kids first, which was really cool. And he handed us this child, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this little thing, I'm afraid I'm going to break it, because that's what us guys think, right? You know, you know this thing's breakable. And, and why do they call them bouncing if they're breakable? <laughs> uh, but I'm convinced he forgot the second part. He handed me the kid, but he forgot the instruction manual. Have you noticed that? Every child, they should come with an instruction manual. See, this is this child, this is what they need, this is what they're, what they're going to do, so you can prepare for what they're going to, you know, mess up, you know. They, they should come with one, and they don't. Uh, I mean, when our daughter, she was born, she wouldn't eat. She almost starved to death, and, and there was no manual on that. And when our son uh, decided that he could fly and jumped off couches when he was about two years old, you know, expecting that gravity wouldn't affect him somehow, you know, uh, <laughs> It, you know, we didn't know what to do. When our daughter, you know, went to high school and started dressing like a hippie, we thought, that's a little strange, it's the 90s, you know, like there's something <laughs> wrong there. You know, uh, when our son wanted to let his hair grow, he would tell he was seven or eight, he had a brush cut, right? He's here this morning, and clearly that's no longer the case. You know, uh, you know when the, our daughter came to us last year and said, I want to get married, and she was only 19 years old, you know, when our son told us he was going to join the school play, it's Disco Inferno, by the way, April 18 to 20, uh, 21st, and uh, he's got three solos. Come on out, see him. It's going to be a great time down at Simon's High. Um, if you want tickets, talk to us, and we'll get you some. You can all sit in the front row and stare at him. <laughs> that's getting our own back, right? You know, that's how this works. Uh, but kids are tough, right? I never dreamed that, that being a parent, being a father, was going to be so hard. I, I never dreamed that, that just, just being an adult, being, being a man in this world, would, would be so hard, there would be so much pressure. I never understood that. And when we look at our Heavenly Father, we have to know that He understands pressure. That He understands how we feel. As Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, so often we focus on the, on the two sons. We focus on that younger son who, who disobeys his father and takes and wastes what he's given. Or we focus, like we did last week, on the older brother and on the way he resented what his, his younger brother had done. And he resented his father for giving in and, and, and just resented, it seems like, everything. But we forget that at the end of the day, the story at its heart is a story about a father, not about a son. It's a story about who God is and what He really wants for us and from us. It's an amazing story. And it's a good thing for us to look at it in, in this way because so often we, we focus on, you can come back to God, you can always come home again. That's what we said about the prodigal son, right? That's what we learned. Or about the older brother, that we need to look in the mirror and realize sometimes we're the ones that have a problem. We're just as lost even though we never went anywhere. But when we learn about the Father, who He is and what He wants, can help to guide our lives. I want you to understand this as we look at the beginning of it. Who is the Father? The first thing that you should know about the Father is He's one who sets His children free. Who sets His children free. Look in verse 11 and 12 again. If you still have your Bibles open. This is so interesting because it's easy for us to point a finger and say, what a lousy dad at these first two verses. It says there was a man who had two sons. So he's a father. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And, and that seems crazy to us. That, that a dad, when the son came and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my share now. <laughs> right? Would do that. Would give him what he asked for. And yet, we see this father being permissive, almost to the point of what we would consider irresponsibility, don't we? It seems irresponsible to give this young boy, who's probably maybe at most 18 or 19 years old, his third of the, of the estate, not knowing what he might do. And yet what we see is a father who's willing to let his son go, who is interested in, in understanding that 
that freedom matters more and that it's something to be claimed and something he's willing to give us. The father lets the son, younger son go. He watches for him to come back. And then when he sees him coming, he runs to him. But freedom is what God is all about. Galatians, the book of Galatians, if you have not read that, you need to take out your Bibles at some point, not now, and, and, and open up your Bible to the book of Galatians. It's a short letter. It doesn't take long to read it. But the whole thing is about freedom and God's passion for freedom. Galatians 5, verse 1, it says that for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. God looked down at us and said, they're trapped by sin. They're trapped by this life. They're trapped by all the pressure that they are under. And he chose to invest his son into creation, to come and to die for us, so that we could know him again and be free. There's an old saying, if you love someone, set, it, set them free, right? You heard that one? If you love something, set it free, right? And, and we like the good part, right? If they really love you in return, they'll come back. And if they don't, you just have to let them go, right? Myself, I kind of prefer if you love someone, set them free. If they don't come back, come down and kill them. <laughs> right? But, but God loves us so much that the first thing he does for us, the very first thing he does for us, is to set us free as our Heavenly Father. That's what he does. He says, I don't need to control you. I love you. And I hope you love me in return. But he sets us free for this journey. Who is the Father? He's one who sets his children free. Secondly, he is one who has important things for us to do. We learn from the younger brother what he does with the younger brother that he sets us free. From the older brother, we learn that he has important work for us to do. The older brother found his meaning in serving his father, didn't he? Where does he come from when he comes to back to the house? He's, he's been out in the fields working for his dad. He's been working on his dad's stuff. And he's been glad to do that for as long as his younger brother's been gone and even before that. God gives us things to do that matter, that last, that make a difference. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, that God has literally listed out this plan, just like we as parents do with our little ones, thinking someday they could this or that, and, and we try and plan it out. He's actually got the stuff ready for us. That if we in our freedom choose to, it's ready to go for us to take and enjoy and be part of something that matters, that will last. See, we're not saved from something, we're saved for something. Okay. We always focus on the fact that He saves us from our sin and the punishment for sin, but friends, we're saved for something task that he's created us to do. I mean, imagine if the, if the Canadian military, imagine if we went to war again and the military started drafting us, right? And, and so we got up to the, the basic training, they took us through six weeks of basic training and issued us the gun and all the gear and everything we need, and then they said, okay, go home, see you later. We'd be like, huh? What? Right? Bad enough to be drafted, right? Taking the force to serve against your will, and, and, and most men that were drafted back in World War II, they served willingly, but they still had to be drafted. They didn't go until they were called. How would they have felt if, if they were trained, equipped, and then sent home? They would have thought it was ridiculous. There was something wrong with the system, wouldn't they? How much more us to follow God and seek after Him that when we come to know Jesus Christ should understand we are saved for something and He's interested in equipping us and then sending us out to do His work that He's prepared in advance for us to do. God, the Father, is one who sets his children free and who has important things for us to do. Not meaningless, trivial things. Important things. Eternal things. Anybody here ever waste time? No. <laughs> yeah, right. Anybody here ever use the phrase, I'm just killing time? Right? If you're a parent, you've killed time because you've had to pick your kids up from stuff. Right? And you get there a little bit early, and, you, and then they're late, and you just sit there and go, oh, you maybe read a book or whatever. Right? But, you know, or now we all got smartphones, we're all playing a game or something, right? <laughs> texting. But wouldn't it be so much better to get to the end of your life knowing that you never had time to waste? Instead, every bit of your time, you got to use for something great, something that made a difference in somebody else's life. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, I can tell you, correct me wrong, wrong Sheldon, you're in the military. Yes. Yes. I, I can tell you, you don't expect your time to be wasted when you're working, do you? Not really. 
Now, sometimes they may waste your time. I grant it's not a perfect system. Right? But, but I, I mean, we, we need to honor those who serve, don't we? And, and we do honor those who serve. And God honors us by inviting us to serve. He says, I set you free, now I invite you to serve. I invite you to do what I've prepared for you to do. Who is the Father? One who sets us free and has important things for us to do. What does He want, though, at the end of the day? What does God want? Isn't that the question we all find ourselves asking from time to time? What do you want from me? Don't we? When things get hard, when things go strange, when, when problems happen, what do you want from me? Why me, God? Right? Well, what does He want? The first thing He wants is for the prodigal son to come home. Verse 20, right? He arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father knows that life is harder without him. That without his strength, without his provision, life is harder than it has to be. It's hard enough. And when he sees us start to come back towards him, he runs to us. And claims this once again as so He doesn't just want us to return, he wants us to be restored. Goes on and tell, he tells his servants, you know, bring the best robe and put it on my son. That robe, the best robe in the house was dad's robe. Did you know that? That wasn't just some really nice robe that they kept on a hook somewhere. That was his very favorite, his very best robe. And he brought it and he put it on his son because he wanted everybody to know, I'm not just glad my son's back. I want you to know he is still completely my son and I'm not ashamed of him. I'm proud of him and I want to show him off. I want everybody to know he's still fully my son. He still belongs completely to me. He may have made a mess of things, but I forgive him and I restore him completely. He puts a ring on his finger for the same reason to say, that's my son. That ring is the family ring. Like the wedding ring that Jim lost. It means so much. It signifies something that is permanent, that lasts. Right? That's what the symbol's all about. That's why we wear rings, because they're symbol of infinity. Did you know that? Right? It goes round and round, never ends. Right? That's why he puts a ring on. He wants to restore the fallen. He wants us to return. Next, he wants to restore the family. How many times haven't we seen this? You ever heard the story about Bob? He, an elderly man, he'd been married almost as long as Uncle Jim, and, and uh, Bob, just, you know, one day he calls up his younger son in Halifax, and he says, I've had it, I'm done with her, I'm getting a divorce. She's driving me crazy, I can't live with this anymore. 45 years of misery is enough. I'm sick of her, I'm sick of talking about it. You call your sister in Toronto, you tell her. And then he hangs up. The son, understandably upset, calls his sister and says, We've got to do something. And the sister calls her father and yells at him, You are not getting a divorce. Bob and I will be there tomorrow. I'll tell them, don't do anything. Do you hear me? The father hangs up the phone, looks at his wife and says, There you go. It worked. The kids are coming for a visit and they're paying their own way. <laughs> God wants to restore the family. Okay? Husbands and wives and kids. And this family. Okay? I mean, they say you can, you can choose your friends, but your relatives you're stuck with. Look around, folks. <laughs> okay? Because when you choose to put your trust in God through Jesus Christ, you become adopted into a family. It's not an optional sort of, oh, I feel like it. And, and yes, there's people in the family that you think, I'd, I'd rather be with my friends. <laughs> and yes, there's times when the family drives you crazy, but it's still your family. And a big part of the strength we gain from following God is by being from, also from being part of His family, of sharing together. When you're hurting, and there's people that know you and care about you, and they choose to act on that, not because of blood that you have, but of, because of the blood of Christ. God wants to restore the family. Society says, I and me. God, on the other hand, says, one another and we. Over and over, almost 60 times, the Bible says one another. It says to love one another. Doesn't it? Over and over. It says be at peace with one another. It says to love one another. It says to be devoted to one another. It says to love one another. It says to honor one another. To love one another. To live in harmony with one another. To love one another. It says to stop judging one another. It says to love one another. To accept 
to love, to instruct, to love, to greet, to love, to wait, to love, to serve, to love, to be kind, to love, to forgive, to love, to submit, to love, to bear with, to love, to teach, and to love, to encourage, to love, to confess, and to love. Get the picture? What are we supposed to do, friends? Love one another. And I'm not some wimpy, oh, nice to see you kind of way. But a way that bears with one another when we're having a bad time. That cares when we're hurting. That celebrates when we're rejoicing. In a way that says, I'm going to take some time and make a difference just because. And that frankly puts up with all the other nonsense that we have. I mean, let's face it, none of us is perfect. We all have irritating things. Ask my wife, I've got my share. <laughs> Or don't ask her, she might share too much. <laughs> God wants the prodigal to return. He wants to restore the fallen and he wants to restore the family. Notice how he speaks to the older brother when the older brother's mad. He says, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. The older brother wasn't willing to even admit that this was his brother anymore. He said to his father, your son did this, right? The Father said, no way, because it's not just about me and him, it's about all of us, we're a family. And he wants to restore it, and he wants to share everything with us. He wants to share with those who are already with him, the older brother, he wants to share with those who are lost, the younger brother. He wants to share in what he's doing. He sets us free, so that we can return and be restored to him and to one another, and share in what he has. C.S. Lewis offers the invitation this way. Great writer. He said, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. Wasn't he a great writer? Wasn't that good? <laughs> says, if you want to get wet, you must get in the water. See, isn't that profound? That's good stuff, right? Wow. That, that's great. Then he says, if you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to, or even into, the thing that has them. If you're close to it, the spray will wet you. If you're not, you'll remain dry. Friends, you can't get a little bit of God. You've got to get all the way in. The Father wants you on His lap, as it were. He wants to wrap His arms around you. He wants to connect you with Him and with His family. That's what He cares about. That's why Easter, we celebrate in two weeks, Good Friday and Easter, the death and resurrection of His only begotten Son. And he did that so that we could be set free to do important things for him and with him. That's the privilege we have. I invite you this morning just to rediscover God, the Heavenly Father. We focus sometimes only on Christ and we forget our Heavenly Father, who's the one that sent Jesus, who set us free, who made the difference. He wants us to come and share his plan for us. So I have a simple challenge for you this morning. We have such good news. We have a father like this. I mean, all of us have earthly fathers, and some of them weren't very perfect. Some of them were far from it. But our Heavenly Father, He's perfect. And He invites us to be part of what He's doing. So here's what He's doing. Here's what I believe He wants us to do. Two weeks to Easter, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Each one invite one. Bring somebody who's maybe wandered away. Bring somebody who maybe never heard the good news. They need to hear it. Where are they going to hear it? Ask somebody to come along, maybe for the first time. Because our Heavenly Father did too much to set us free, and we need to share that freedom. Just like those who go and fight for freedom overseas, and we honor them, will you fight for freedom here for those who are trapped by death and sin? They need to know their Father, and you have the opportunity to introduce them. I invite you to invite one, each of you, at least one. If you want more, that's great. Because someone needs to know God. Someone needs hope, peace, and purpose for their life. Like you've already received. Would you pray with me?